Welcome to the opening session of the PXRB 2021 workshop. This is the fourth edition of this kind of workshops. It's online in this chance, thanks to the support from the Valencian International University. The Valencian International University is a pioneering online academic institution with more than 10 years of history. And we have grown to have more than 15,000 students from 86 different countries. Our international academic staff combines poorly academic profiles with enterprise and businesses profiles. That gives our degrees a lot of agility to adapt to the needs of the society and the job market. That's especially true in the case of the School of Science, Engineering and Technology, the school within view that organizes uh, this event. I would uh, give a special thanks to the European Space Agency because it was ready to support travel expenses for students coming to Valencia if at the end this uh, meeting had been uh, physically organized here. So all that said, I hope you're enjoying this meeting. Many new uh, interesting advances and new approaches to the problems will be presented. Also, a couple of outreach talks will be organized, organized uh, during the week uh, that we are going to be here together discussing uh, these topics. And now I just will uh, let Peter Kresmer uh, be in charge of the opening uh, talk, uh, introducing in a very broad way all the problems and all the uh, research activities related to these BXRB systems. Uh, thank you. Good day, my name is Peter Kretschmer and I'm going to introduce the BX Binary Conference 2021. I'm going to talk about why we are meeting, what we are going to talk about, and who is coming to the conference. And the why we are meeting is possibly a good question. As you see on the screen behind me, you see the galaxy and the Magellan clouds as seen by European Space Agency's Gaia satellite. In the galaxy, we have about 200 billion stars. We have another 30 billion about in the large and 3 billion in the small Magellanic clouds. Among all these stars, there's about 200 binary systems, which we consider big binary systems at this stage. So why do we care about such few? Just like caring about seven or eight people in the whole world. Well, astronomers like to specialize, but there are more reasons, and I'll try to explain them in the next slides. So let's first introduce what we are actually talking about. This is an artist's illustration of a BXV binary system made on relatively realistic simulations. And the term BXV binary is actually quite trivial. It means you have a BE star in a binary system with called a creating compact object producing X-rays. Now that compact object, which is a short term for black hole or neutron star, in practically all the systems is a neutron star. We know exactly one system where it is a black hole and are typically doing an elliptical orbit around the massive star at the front. And as you see on this image around that star, there's like a whirlpool, an extended disk, and then there's another whirlpool in the background where there's the compact object. Now BE stars, were observed first as something special. They were B stars within the astronomical classification of stars with their letters, and they had emission lines, which is a bit rare because we usually have absorption lines by which we classify stars. So people first said, okay, B star with these specific emission lines, that's a BE star. Over time, we found that that was too generous a category, and we reduced it a bit more because otherwise lots of stars would have been classified as this. We mean special stars, and nowadays we are very sure 
that these emissions must come from a disk around the star, like shown in the sketch. And depending on the angle that you look, you see lines with specific shapes. This disk forms through rapid rotation, for sure, is one aspect. Another one will be pulsations. But we are not 100% sure. It's still a question of research how these factors actually play together. So colleagues, other colleagues are still very busy figuring out how this whole mechanism works. Now, again, the mass donor, a BE star, you see on the lower left uh, visualization of the sizes of stars. Our sun is there with the letter G, would be letter G. In the BE stars, there are bright B stars, sometimes O stars. So bright and massive stars on the order of 10 times the mass of the sun and on the order of 10,000 times the brightness of the sun. In comparison, the X-ray source is a small object. It is really tiny. It's actually still more massive than the sun. But as you see, the sun is small compared to the B stars. On the right, you see the sun with some planets. And you won't even see the Earth, I'm quite sure, on your screen right now. It is there in the foreground. It is marked now with a circle. But to actually visualize how small a neutron star is, I have to go zoom in quite a bit. So a neutron star with what we know now, a typical radius of about 12 kilometers, and the mass, about 1.5, the solar mass, give or take a little bit, would cover Valencia greater area, not more. And this tiny object is producing X-rays and can become as bright in X-rays as the massive star, so many thousand times brighter than the sun, but in X-rays. These tiny neutron stars, this plays a big role in what we see, often have huge magnetic fields. On the left side, you see the proud press release of the Fermilab in June 2020. They had the world record for a magnet in an accelerator, 14.5 Tesla. This is a lot. The big magnets you might have encountered before are maybe one or a few. But a typical neutron star, base run of the world neutron star, can easily have 100 million Tesla. Now, this enormous magnetic field will mean that as matter is coming close to the neutron star, it's not just flowing in. It's not falling in any way. It will always be funneled to the magnetic poles. Now, this is nicely illustrated in this image, but the image is actually misleading. This would be already a neutron star with what we would call a weak magnetic field, a million times louder than on Earth, but weak. Because for the classical, typical case, the range where the magnetic field completely dominates everything is a few, times, a few hundred times larger than the neutron star. So if you go back to the image with Valencia and the neutron star, the magnetic field would dominate the flow of matter out to Italy, Switzerland, something like that. The BE system are quite varied population. We find them in the galaxy, about half of the systems we know, a little bit less, are actually in our galaxy. Then 10% in the large Magellanic Cloud. And the other half is in the small Magellanic Cloud, which is, after all, much, much smaller, has much fewer stars. So the ratio of creation of BEX rated batteries in the small Magellanic Clouds is much higher, which indicates that there was relatively recently an event where a lot of massive stars were born in astronomical terms recently. And while we're in the Milky Way with this one black hole, we sort of would have expected that's about what we would have expected. We would actually have expected somewhat more black holes in the small Magellanic clouds. But at the moment, this is again a question of research. So still, I haven't yet explained why we think they are interesting. Well, first of all, you can hardly ignore them when they become really bright. What you see here is a light curve taken with X-ray monitoring satellites of one of the most famous systems. It's also one of the brightest things we've seen in the sky. So basically, the curve shows these sharp peaks, which is on a scale of many years. Otherwise, it would be longer. <coughs> They're weeks to months sometimes. Well, as the source goes into outbursts, becomes bright. The orange line, the horizontal line, indicates 
the brightness level of the Crab Nebula, which is what we typically take to say this is a very bright source. Some sources go brighter, but typically not much more than a few times the brightness of the Crab Nebula in X-rays. Many other sources, the famous huge black hole in another galaxy, yeah, they are expressed in millicrab, thousands of the crab. So this source went more than 10 times the brightness of the crab. Basically, you just cannot ignore it. They just showed up in our X-ray detectors, and you have a huge bright beast showing up. You, are inter you follow it. Now, they don't only do this once or twice. A lot of these sources show multiple outbursts. The diagram on the left may be a little bit hard to read at the beginning. It basically shows a long time, the times color in color, when the source was considered to be active, so above a certain level of activity. And you see regular spacing. It seems regular. It is regular. The spacing is often driven by the orbital period. And that's what we have as, then as model. But you also see that it's not always. I mean, sometimes it's really quite regular. Others do it on or off. And that remains one of the main open questions in research we have. Why is it sometimes so regular and sometimes not? People have been going from very, very simple models with the kind of light curve on the upper left where you have the, just these two peaks and say, OK, every orbit, it comes close, it captures some matter, we get an outburst. We see that's not happening. Then about 20 years ago, there were the seminal publications by Okazaki and Negerolea, which demonstrated a model, and which you can still see in the lower right model, where the interaction between the Newton star tidal forces and a growing or slightly different disk would sometimes drive an outburst, sometimes not. So that is still the state of affairs. People are going to more and more complex views, simulating this in three dimensions. And on the upper right, you see something that is actually also a disk, but it's no longer a smooth disk and sort of circular. It's elongated, warped, tilted. And with all this, we are trying and working to understand how outbursts happen, how they get their exact shape. We have the basic picture we understand since decades. We still are working on understanding it in detail. Another interesting aspect about the X-ray binaries is that they're really worth studying across all the electromagnetic spectrum. I've emphasized a lot because I'm an X-ray astronomer, the X-ray variability, but some of these systems we see up to even higher energies, the gamma rays. We tend to see the bright star, the E star, so it can be followed by optical telescope, it can be followed in the infrared, and quite a number of systems, and some systems you also see in the radio. So you have the whole electromagnetic spectrum, you have astronomers working with different instruments who can all obtain information about these systems. Getting a bit more technical, when we follow in the X-rays one of these outbursts, we see that the system changes, and it doesn't change in a random way, it changes in a sort of uh, trend going back and forth. In these plots, taken from many sources from Rage and Espoli 2013, as the flux goes up in the vertical direction, yeah, the X-ray color, the ratio between two bands and X-rays, shifts in a system, more or less systematic way, and one can here see something like branches in this. It goes up to a point, and then it changes its behavior, goes back, and we can follow that and study that. What we also see is, if you have an accreting pulsar with this matter flowing to the poles and the star is rotating, you get pulsations. You can make the pattern of that pulsation. And the Newton star stays the same, but this pattern changes. So something must change in how the X-rays are generated. Something must change how the light is emitted from the Newton star as we go through different levels of the outburst. And again, just some examples where you see that for the same source on the left, you see quite different shapes, and it's maybe a little bit hard to see on the right, but also for different times, you get different shapes. And you can study that. In the spectra of some accreting neutron star x ray binaries, we see something we call cyclone lines. These are broad lines created by the scattering of X-rays on electrons, which are actually on quantized loops around the magnetic field and close to the pole of the neutron star. On the right is one of the most beautiful examples where you see directly in the raw data, you see these waves 
But these are very, very broad lines. And studying them again tells us a lot about the physics at the poles of the neutron stars. These lines sometimes, in some sources, shift their position with luminosity. This is quite open subject in which I've myself been involved a bit. And as you see in the lower plot, it isn't actually so clear. You have this one green one yeah, where it goes down, it seems to go to lower value. The vertical axis is the energy where we find the line as the brightness increases to the right. In the other sources, it seems to stay flat. Sometimes it seems to go up a little bit at one end. And a very recent result, therefore it's not included in the other plot, they see something going, possibly going down and something coming up. It's still a preprint, so we'll have to see how that result is published. Studying this is interesting, but puzzling, and about half of the sources we can study this well are BX3 binaries. It's not only the X-ray data that varies, you also see the optical spectra varying. We are tracing with the optical spectroscopy the changes in this disk around the massive star. At first, again, it seems sometimes easy. You have a disk growing, and then you have an outburst, and the disk somehow disperses. As you go into the details, it becomes more complicated, as so often in science. But still, it is something very worthwhile, interesting, very worthwhile to pursue, and sometimes hard to get time for, because in that sense, a star is too easy a target for a huge telescope, and not quite the kind of thing you do from your backyard with a very small one, at least until recently. So the main point that drives the interest from astrophysicists like me of these systems is that we are probing physics in such a system at completely different scale. The system itself is on the order of tens or hundreds of, mil of billions of meters, millions of kilometers. Then we go down to the magnetosphere at hundred thousands to kilometers maybe or more and then we go the matter is focused to the accretion pole on the star remember a radius of 12 kilometer and the actual accretion column the part where the x-rays come from in some systems maybe only a few meters high in other systems it may be kilometers but still you have a very tiny area from which then 10,000 up to 10,000 times or more the luminosity of the sun may come from so there's a lot of modeling effort, and I'm not going to talk you through all what you see here in great detail, but people are working very hard. On the left side, you see the tilted red plane. That's the disk around the main star. A little bit to the right of it, that funny cloud of dots. That's a more realistic hydrodynamic simulation of a disk which is tilted and very hard to see, but there is a black little neutron star right beside it twisting the disk already shown below. So you have all these matter and some complicated flow of matter towards the neutron star. Then it falls towards the neutron star, and we're trying to understand the geometry of this accretion column, which may be more or less like a cone or cylinder, but with areas, with shocks, with emission regions, with all sorts of astrophysical interactions under conditions which we just cannot create in a laboratory, but it might actually not be a full cylinder. It might be like on the right-hand side, something open, a little bit like the northern lights on the Earth, which are usually don't, do not form a full circle. But if you then try to understand that, and people try to do that with the models on the right, you sort of make a model, okay, it is emitting like this, or it's emitting like this. It gets, again, even more complicated because you must include the gravitational light bending effect of the general relativistic distorted space around the neutron star. If you don't do that, it gets completely wrong. And while it's not self-evident from that picture, on the right-hand side, you see a neutron star, and what you see on the upper left and lower right behind the star, these two spots, that's the same spot, the same column on the other side of the neutron star. But light emitted on the other side of the neutron star gets bent around the neutron star and comes straight at us at Earth. And modeling all this in one go is a big challenge, and a lot of work is going on in this direction. So, who is coming? Well, we actually have, at the latest count I took, about 100 attendants to this conference, and they come 
from almost all over the world. We should have found somebody in Australia to make this complete. 60 places about in five continents. And the range of people is big. This goes from students to emeritus professor, and they all come together to share what they are working on, what they are interested in, to see what other people are learning and how things might go from there. So there's a quite broad program which handles the outbursts, studies of timing, studies across the electromagnetic spectrum, multi-wavelength observations, studies of what kind of groups exist within the BX3 binaries, the specific class of gamma ray binaries which emit brightly at ultra high energies, a little bit about what we have in current and future space missions, and then another block which is this complicated question of how can we combine models to the observations in a way that it works out. And in the beginning, I had a draw, tried to make actually a drawing here, where I connected some of these subject topics with different scales and found, no, it doesn't really work. An individual talk in any of these sections might be just talking about the system scale or just about the neutron star. But if I take them together, we are always covering the whole systems. And that's the charm and the challenge of it. Now, in practice, we will have to have a virtual meeting because of the COVID crisis affecting all the world. I still hope that one of the most important elements that we've had at previous such workshops, in Valencia, for example, we discussed, we sat together, we had a free exchange of information, of ideas, of opinions. And I hope we will be able to repeat that in cyberspace. Unfortunately, the other social part of just sitting together then at a very relaxed lunch or dinner will unfortunately not work. So that will be for a future edition. So in summary, I'm just looking forward to having a great meeting and to learn some things I don't know yet about these systems. Thank you very much, and I hope you are looking as much forward to some exciting days ahead as I am.